Well, this morning, as I am so full of being back from the Holy Land, uh, we'll probably be here about an hour today as I share the Word of God. No, I'm teasing. I'm going to try to be brief, as hard as that is for me. But I want to share with you this morning about the risen Son of God. The risen Son of God. Luke 24, if you'll look with me there. You know, today is the day that Christians all over the world, in every country, every language, all over the world, Christians celebrate this reality, this fact, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. When Jesus Christ came as the Son of Man, born of a woman, Jesus knew what his purpose was. In Matthew 20, verse 28, he said this, that the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. When Jesus was born of a woman in the manger, the Christmas story, Jesus came as a human being, as a person like us with flesh and blood, and he knew that the reason that he came was not to be served, but to serve us. Can you imagine that? God, the Son of God, the creator of all things, came to earth to serve the creature. He came to serve sinners like us. And, and, and he said that the ultimate act of service would be that he would give his life, that he would die on a cross as a ransom for many. When Jesus died on the cross as a ransom, that means that he paid the price for our freedom. And, and from the very beginning, Jesus, the Son of Man, knew that is what he came to do. But the Bible also says in Romans chapter 1, verse 4, that this Son of Man was declared to be the Son of God by his resurrection from the dead. And it is the resurrection of Jesus Christ that declares that the Son of Man that was born in the manger is the Son of God that was raised from the dead on this day of Resurrection Sunday. The empty, the empty tomb declares that Jesus is not just an, another dead prophet, but he is literally the living Son of God, the Messiah, the one and only Savior of the world. And this morning, as we look at our text, we're going to see in our text today that the tomb where Jesus was buried, the stone was rolled away, and that angels from God announced that Jesus had risen from the dead. Now, before we read our text, let me give you a little bit of the background of our text. Uh, Jesus Christ had been crucified, uh, just as he had said that he would be, and after he was crucified, his body, normally, those that were crucified, that were criminals, were normally cast into Gehenna, which was referred to as a lake of fire, where criminals' bodies were cast over a cliff and they were all burned. That would have been customary for someone who was crucified as a criminal. However, the Jews took the burial of a dead body very seriously. The scriptures laid down quite firmly that no dead body was to be left unburied. The Jews were very, it was a very sacred thing to bury the body of the dead. As soon as a person was dead, his eyes would be closed, he would be kissed with love, his body would be washed thoroughly, and then there would be the anointing of his body with, with different oils and perfumes to try to cover up the smell of a dead body. And, and then by the time of Christ, the custom was that the body would be elaborately wrapped in a shroud. And the face was covered with a special cloth called the sidarium. And so that, that cloth on his face was the sidarium. And because Jesus was loved by many, instead of them casting his body like a criminal into Gehenna, that, that lake of fire where bodies were burned, Joseph of Arimathea was a very prestigious man, a wealthy Jew who was a member of the Sanhedrin, like the Supreme Court of the Jewish people. He was a Pharisee. But he was one of the few Pharisees who had become a believer in Jesus. 
Now, he was a secret believer. He, he didn't let everybody know because he would be persecuted and kicked out of the Sanhedrin. But the Bible says that he was a secret disciple. And he went to Pilate, who had had Jesus crucified, and he asked for the body of Jesus. And, and he had a grave that was very near where Jesus was crucified. He had a tomb. And in those days, tombs were cut into stone. They were, they were, especially a wealthy man like Joseph of Arimathea, his tomb was cut into a cave, into a rock, and it was there where wealthy people would be buried. So Joseph asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate consented, consent, uh, consented and he took the body of Jesus, and they had to quickly prepare it because the next day after Jesus was crucified was the Sabbath Saturday, the, the day of Passover. So, they, so Nick, the Bible says that Nicodemus, if you look in the parallel account of John, Nicodemus brought 75 pounds of expensive ointment, oils, perfumes. And they, they washed the body of Jesus. They, they, they put those perfumes on the body of Jesus and they wrapped him in that grave cloth. And then they took him And they placed him in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, and they put a rock over the tomb. And so that is where we find Jesus. Now, in our text that we're going to read, there were some women that loved Jesus, that followed Jesus everywhere he went. Mary Magdalene, whom he had cast out demons. There was Mary the mother of James the Less, one of the disciples. There was Joanna. These women uh, supported Jesus. They, they were believers in Jesus. And, and just like women today, they, they were kind of thinking, well, if anything's going to be done right, it's got to be done right by women, right? That these men, they surely didn't do a good job preparing the body of Jesus. And that's true at North Park. If we want anything done right around here, guess who we get to do it? Women. I mean, when the women do it, they do it right. I mean, us men, we just kind of throw it together sometimes. But women, wow. When we see the things that women do at North Park, it's amazing. And I think these women were thinking, you know, we've got, we got to do this right. We need, it. we need to anoint the body of Jesus. We need to make sure he has the right burial. So they couldn't do it on the Sabbath, on that Saturday because it was against their custom on Passover, so they had to wait till Sunday, the first day of the week. So, so Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus have already buried Jesus, but they want to make sure that he's buried right. And so they're on their way to the tomb early Sunday morning, and, and they're bringing some expensive ointments to anoint the body of Jesus right. And let's pick up with our text. Would you stand with me? To honor the reading of God's word. Matthew 24, verse 1, it says, But on the first day of the week, that would have been Sunday, the day after Passover, at the early dawn, they, these precious women, went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. And they found the stone was rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And while they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. Those were angels. And as they were frightened, the angels, they bowed their heads to the ground. And the angels, the men, said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here but he is risen. Amen? Hallelujah. They said, remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven disciples and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, 
And they did not believe them. The disciples did not believe them. But Peter, the Lord's disciple, rose and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen cloths by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for the resurrection of Jesus. This is so powerful. I pray, God, that you would give us ears today to hear what your Spirit would say to your church this morning about the resurrection of Christ. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. The main idea I want to share with you today is that Jesus was raised from the dead for us to know who he is. That's the reason Jesus was raised from the dead, to leave no doubt so that any of us, even 2,000 years later, we would know without any shadow of a doubt, without any mistaking it, that Jesus Christ really was the Son of Man who came to give his life a ransom for many and the living Son of God who was the Messiah, the Savior of the whole world. Now, there are three things I want you to notice with me as we look at our text this morning. Number one, I want you to notice with me that the masses were confused about Jesus. The masses of people that were living in those days were very confused about who Jesus is. Even these women that went to the tomb on that, on that, on that Sunday were confused about who he is. Because, let me tell you why. Because Jesus had told them on more than one occasion that he was going to Jerusalem, that he was going to die, and that he was going to rise again from the dead. He had told them that. They had heard that with their own ears. When they went to the tomb that morning, on that Sunday, instead of going there to anoint the dead body of Jesus with more perfume, they should have been going there with expectancy. They should have been going there to see an empty tomb. They should have been going there believing that, hey, he's not going to be here. Let's go see that, that if what he told us is true, that, that he's risen from the dead. That should have been what they were going to see. But instead, they had not heard in their heart what Jesus had said. And instead of going to see a risen Lord, they were going to anoint his body. And when they went there, the Bible says that they were perplexed. The Bible says they were perplexed when they saw that the stone had been rolled away. That word perplexed means that they were anxious, that they didn't understand it. You see, when they had seen the stone that was rolled away, they should have celebrated. And then when the angels came, they were frightened. But beloved, they're not the only ones who didn't understand it. Why were so many people confused about Jesus? You know, on Palm Sunday, when Jesus had his triumphant entry into Jerusalem, that day when he came riding on a donkey and everyone, the crowds were waving palm branches and they were shouting what? Hosanna, Hosanna. Do you know what the palm branch represented to the Jewish people, the palm branch was a symbol of revolt. The, the palm branch was the symbol of the Maccabean revolt that was led by Judas Maccabee, uh, who was referred to as the hammer, in 160 B.C., after that revolt, when he revolted and, and, and won victory for the Jewish people, there were coins that were minted that had the palm tree on the coin, and it said the freedom of Jerusalem. You see, the Jewish expectation regarding the coming Messiah, they, they were looking for the Messiah to come, but they were looking for a conquering king, not a suffering servant. They thought that the Messiah would be the one that would be like Judas of Maccabee, the hammer who would lead the Jewish people, the, the, the nation of Israel, 
to overthrow the oppressive Roman government and like King David to lead the nation of Israel back to prominence again. And when they saw Jesus perform miracles, all the miracles that we read about in the New Testament, they interpreted those different than we do. They would look at those miracles and think, okay, the kingdom of Israel is about to come. He's about to lead the revolt. When they were waving palm branches as Jesus came into Jerusalem, they were literally thinking it's about to happen. Remember when Moses went into Egypt and he said to Pharaoh, let all the people go free? And then what happened? God began to perform miracle after miracle. And and the result of that was the people of Israel went free and the Egyptians were conquered, right? So in their mind, they're thinking that Jesus, like Moses, was going to overthrow Rome and lead the people back to being free once again and not under the oppressive Roman government. And as they waved those palm branches, it was a symbol of rebellion. And when they said Hosanna, do you know what Hosanna means? It means save us now. Save us now. So when they said save us now, they weren't thinking about the salvation of our soul as sinners. They were thinking about the salvation of the Jewish people to overthrow the oppressive Roman government. So you understand now, when Jesus was arrested and those people that were waving palm branches wanting to revolt and saying, save us now, why they quickly turned from Hosanna to what? Crucify him. Crucify him. In other words, they were saying, he's not the Messiah that we thought that he was going to be. And that is why so many, even even his disciples, never heard when he told them that he was going to die and be crucified because even they thought that he was going to be the conquering king, not the suffering servant. Well, beloved, a lot of things haven't changed in 2,000 years. I was in Israel last week, and as I... As Rondi and I were in Israel, I can tell you, just like Jesus wept over the city of Jerusalem, I was in the city of Jerusalem, and I wanted to weep over the city myself. Let me show you a couple of sites we saw there. This was Jerusalem today. This was pictures I took last week. On the left is the, what we call the west wall of the temple. That's the only wall... The, the bottom of that wall is the only wall remaining of Herod's temple, the temple that was there when Jesus was there. The Romans destroyed it. That's the only thing that's left. And, and that west wall, we call it the Wailing Wall. And there will not be a day that goes by that you will not find Orthodox Jews with their nose at that wall weeping and wailing. Do you know what today, 2,000 years later, they're weeping over? They're weeping over the fact that they no longer have a temple so they can sacrifice animals. And they're weeping over the fact that they still do not have a Messiah. They're weeping over the fact that they think their Messiah still has not come. And then we went into the synagogue that's right there beside the Wailing Wall. And that fellow on the right is an Orthodox Jew who still chanting and going back and forth and he's got a phylactery on his head that has scripture on it taking Deuteronomy 6 kind of to an extreme that it was never meant to take and 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 he's wailing and they're going through the rituals of worship because they do not have a temple to sacrifice animals and they do not believe they have a messiah does that not break your heart 2,000 years later this is Jerusalem today And then the next slide is from the Mount of Olives where Jesus wept over the city. And you see the Dome of the Rock. That is a Muslim mosque that sits on the Temple Mount where the Jewish temple, the Temple of Solomon, the Temple of Herod used to be there. It was destroyed by the Romans. The Muslim got control and they built the Dome of the Rock. And there 
while there is a wailing wall right beside that Dome of the Rock, that's what they're weeping over, that, that they don't have a temple because the Muslim mosque is there. And you've got Jews that are right there beside that Muslim mosque weeping over the fact that they have no Messiah. And then you've got Muslims that are worshiping a, a false religion in that mosque, a religion that is oppressive, a religion that really doesn't offer a lot of hope, a, a religion that uh, takes advantage of women, a religion that causes a lot of conflict and war, that, that doesn't offer, offer the hope of salvation by grace through faith. And, and this is the holy city today, the great city of Jerusalem the, the city where Christ came, and, and all these years later, the masses of people are still confused. As I thought about that Jesus wept over the city, I was there at the very place he wept over the city, and can I tell you, I felt the same emotion. Oh, how I felt like weeping because nothing has changed. Years ago, John the Baptist said it so plainly. In John 129, he saw Jesus coming toward him, and he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. How simple is that? There's no need to sacrifice animals anymore in a temple. There's no need for, for all those rituals because the Messiah has come, and he is the Lamb of God who came to take away the sins of the world. So beautiful, so simple, so holy, so pure. But so many people in the world today are still confused. Oh, there's a second thing I want you to see with me. Number two, notice not only the masses were confused about Jesus, but the mission was confirmed by Jesus. In, in verse four, look what the angel said. While they were perplexed, the women who came to the tomb, the angel stood by them in dazzling apparel, and they were, they were frightened. The women were frightened. They bowed their faces to the ground, and the men said, why are you seeking the living among the dead? He is not here, the angel said. He is risen. And notice the next phrase, remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men be crucified, and rise again the third day. So, so the angel said, do you not remember, ladies? <laughs> I mean, do, do you not remember how Jesus has told you exactly what was going to happen? You see, at least three times, Jesus had, had emphatically, clearly, without any confusing words, explained what was going to happen to him. In Matthew 16... Verses 21 through 23, right after Peter, the Lord's disciple, had made that great confession of faith, when Jesus said, who do you say that I am? And Peter said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Right after that, Jesus told them who he was. Now, why did Jesus tell them who he was right after that? Because Jesus is trying to help them understand, yes, I am the Christ, the Son of living God, but I didn't come to be a conquering king. I came to be a suffering servant. Here's what he said to them. Notice, he said, from that time on, after Peter's great confession, from that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes, be killed, and on the third day, he said, I will be raised. And then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, far be it from you, Lord. This shall never happen to you. In other words, you're going to be our conquering king. You're not going to die. But Jesus turned to Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. Wow. He said, you are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of men. Very clear. Well, a, a second time, right after the transfiguration of Jesus, when Jesus went up on the mountain of transfiguration and Moses and Elijah came down to, to speak to Jesus and the disciples saw that, right after that, 
Again, Jesus reminded them in Matthew 17, 22 and 23, Jesus said, as they were going to Galilee, Jesus said to them, the Son of Man is about to be delivered in the hands of men. They will kill him, but he will be raised on the third day. And they were greatly distressed. Again, they're like, no, no, you're the conquering king. This can't happen to you. Right after the transfiguration, he reminds them. Third time, right before they went in to Jerusalem for the triumphant entry, when everybody's saying Hosanna, in Luke 18, 31 through 34, taking the 12 aside, he said to them, see that we are going up to Jerusalem. And everything that is written about the Son of Man by the prophets will be accomplished. For he will be delivered over to the Gentiles, be mocked, shamefully treated, and spit upon. And after flogging him, they will kill him. But on the third day, he will rise again. And it says, but they understood none of these things. Notice the detail. He went even into more detail, right? He said, they're going to flog me. They're going to spit on me. But every time he said, but I will rise again. But every time... They were confused. You see, Jesus constantly confirmed his mission. He knew what he had come to do. Do you know what that means for every one of us here today? When Jesus was crucified on Calvary's cross for our sin, that did not catch him by surprise. It was not something that he could have avoided if he wanted to. He could have called down legions of angels to deliver him, knowing what was going to happen, he went to the cross to give his life for me and you for one reason, because he loves you, because he cares about you, because the only way that our sins can be forgiven is that he died as a ransom for our sins, that he shed his blood to take away our sins, so that we could be reconciled from a God that we are separated from by our sin and that we could receive all the blessings of being a son of God, the blessings of eternal life in heaven, a relationship with God. That is why Jesus came. And he said it over and over again. The last thing I want you to see with me, not only the masses that were confused and the mission that Jesus confirmed, But notice there were many who confessed in Jesus after his resurrection. Many believed in him. It says, if you look at verse 13, it says that the day that Jesus rose, there were these two guys that were on a a, a road to Emmaus. They were walking down the road to Emmaus. That was a village about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all the things that had happened. In other words, you know, they're, they're discussing uh, the, the, re- the crucifixion of Christ and even the rumors that were already started that he had risen. And notice that Jesus, the resurrected Jesus himself, drew near <laughs> and went to them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. So Jesus starts walking with these two men, and they, they don't know who it is. They don't know that it's the resurrected Jesus. And he said to them, And this is what makes me think God really has a sense of humor, doesn't he? I mean, Jesus has a sense of humor. And he said, what is the conversation that you're holding? And and they stood still looking at this man. Then one of them named Cleopas, and we don't know exactly who Cleopas is. Some speculate that he might have been Jesus' uncle. But whoever he is, Cleopas answered, are you the only visitor in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened? I mean, I mean, everybody knows. I mean, everybody's talking about it. Are you the only one that doesn't know? And he said to them, what things? And they said to him concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty indeed, and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. Now look at verse 21. They said, we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Boy, Cleopas is digging himself in a deeper hole, right? He's saying we had hoped he was going to be the conquering king. We thought he was going to be the redeemer, the one to set us free. And and, And now it is the third day since these things happened, he said. 
And moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find the body, they came back saying that they had seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. And some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. I mean, when you read that, what are you thinking with me? Aren't you thinking, Cleopas, what are you doing on the road to Emmaus, right? I mean, if I had heard that there was an empty tomb where Jesus was buried, I would be on the road back to Jerusalem going to see that empty tomb. But they're still so confused. And, and they're not believing these reports. And moreover, some of our women amazed us and, and, and when they did not see the body. Look at verse 24. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it as the women had said. Then verse 25, Jesus said, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe, all that the prophets have spoken. Jesus said, was it not necessary that Christ would suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Oh, I would love to have heard that sermon. Jesus Christ, the risen Son of God, went back to the Old Testament and began to teach them as they walked down the road everything that the Old Testament said about himself. I don't know what was in that sermon, but I, I would be certain that, that he, he talked about Abraham and his sacrifice of Isaac and the ram that was caught in the thicket that, that was sacrificed instead of the only son of Isaac. I'm certain that he would have talked about the Passover lamb whose blood was put on the doorpost in Israel and every house that had the blood over the door was saved. I'm certain he would have talked about the serpent that was raised on a pole in the wilderness and everyone who looked at the serpent would have lived. I'm certain he would have talked about the prophecy of Isaiah chapter 53 where Isaiah said in Isaiah 53, verse 6 and 7, All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned every one to his own way. But the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. He was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb led to the slaughter, and like sheep before its shearer is silent. And as he spoke those words, look at, look at what Cleopas said. It said, as they drew near the village, verse 28, to which they were going, he acted as if he was going to go on further. But they urged him strongly, saying, stay with us, for it is toward evening, and, and it, it is far spent. So they, they went to stay with them. And he was at the table with them. Jesus sat at the table. He took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. And then it says this, and their eyes were opened. And they recognized Jesus. And he vanished from their sight. And they said to one another, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road and while he opened to us the scriptures? Oh, you see, their eyes were opened. And just like that is what had to happen so many years ago, that's what has to happen today. I can preach my heart out this morning. I, I can tell you about what I saw. If you look on the screen at the picture, that, that is Golgotha. That's the place of the skull. The Bible says that Jesus was crucified at Golgotha. Do you see the two eyes, the nose, the mouth uh, there? I mean, it's prominent. If you see that picture in, in uh, even before this picture years ago when erosion had not placed it, it is an ominous skull, and it was on that hill where Jesus was crucified. And right around from that hill, there is a tomb cut into rock that has been found. And, and it looks like this. It's called the Garden Tomb. It's right there beside Golgotha. That was the tomb of a rich man. And, and, and that tomb is there. And I went inside that tomb. Let me show you what I saw. You know what I saw inside that tomb? Nothing, <laughs> nothing, there's nobody there. That is the tomb of the Lord Jesus Christ, many believe. And, and, and I can tell you with all my heart, he is risen. The tomb is empty. He is not there. 
And, and, and yet I can show you, I can preach it to you, I can tell you that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. But no matter how much I weep over you and pray for you, only God can open your eyes. Only God can open your eyes. The Bible says in John chapter 1, verse 11 and 12, he came to his own and his own people did not receive him. They were looking for a conquering king. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. To all who believe him, even today, he gives them the right to become the children of God. Are you still confused in your thoughts about Jesus? Can I tell you this? There's 4,200 religions in the world today. Listen. 4,200 religions in the world today. Maybe that confuses you. But there's only one empty tomb. Only one. Would you like to confess your faith in Jesus today? Oh, I pray. I've been praying for you all week. I've been weeping, praying that just one person here today who's been confused, who's never been saved, who's never received forgiveness and salvation by grace through faith, that, that there would be one today who would say, yes, yes, today is the day. I want to believe in Jesus today. There's 4,200 religions in the world, only one empty tomb. Would you bow your head with me? All over this room, could we just bow our heads and close our eyes before God? Would you like to say yes to Jesus? Would you like to confess your faith in Jesus? If you would like to confess your faith in Jesus, I'm going to pray with you in a moment. And I'm going to ask that you would pray this prayer with me in your heart. If you pray this prayer, it's not a magic formula, but if you mean it in your heart, you will be saved. Pray this prayer with me. Oh, dear Jesus, I need you today. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. Today I see it clearly. I see that you came as the Son of Man to give your life as a ransom for me so that I could be set free. And right now in my heart, I realize that I need you. My eyes have been opened. And right now I confess you your death, your burial, your resurrection. I confess that for my salvation. I put my faith in you and you alone, not my works, not religion. But I put my faith in you, Jesus, for my salvation. I trust you, and with all my heart, I receive your forgiveness and your gift of eternal life. If you pray that prayer while heads are bowed and eyes are closed, if you look at the screen, you lift your eyes there's a number on the screen, 205-236-5700. On your phone right now, take it out. Would you just text the word Jesus? The word Jesus, just the word Jesus. Text it to that number, 205-236-5700. If you text the word Jesus to that number, I will text you and I will celebrate with you that today you open your heart to Jesus and I will ask your permission to call you and set up a time to meet with you so that we can talk about how you can fully understand what it means to be a new believer in Christ. Text it right now. Text that word, Jesus. In a moment, I'll be standing here. If you want to come and tell me publicly, I'll be here at the front. If you want to see me at Meet the Pastor, I'll be there. You do what the Lord leads you to do. Father, I pray you speak to hearts all over the room today. God, there may be those that need to recommit their life to you. Been out of church for a long time. Easter Sunday is the first time they've been. God, I pray that they would start coming. Oh, how we would love for them to be a part of our North Park family where they could grow and build friendships. God, I pray that there would be some today that would recommit their heart to you. God, I pray there might be those that would be led to join our church family today. I pray, God, that every person that hasn't been saved, that today 
that they would make that commitment. And let me know, Father, today, right now, in Jesus' name, amen. Oh, hallelujah.